just a phrase. No man is poor if he has friends. And then there's another phrase, uh, nobody's born to be a failure. And with those two things, Capra, Capra took the two. I'll never forget it. Jimmy's been a film actor for nearly 50 years, and during that time, he's made over 80 films. Jimmy's often said, I never think of audiences as customers. I consider them my partners. The movies that, that you are best known for in those early years in Hollywood were the Capra films. Tell us about Frank Capra. A couple of weeks ago, the new president of Columbia Pictures gave a luncheon for Frank Capra to celebrate the 50th anniversary of It Happened One Night. And that's the kind of a thing I, I've never happened before. I, I've never heard of it happening. But it, uh, you can certainly see why Columbia did it, because Columbia was on Gower Street, would you used to be called Poverty Row in Hollywood, and Columbia was right at the bottom of it. And then Harry Cohen was determined somehow to get the thing, pull the thing. They were doing these westerns in the Hollywood Hills, and uh, a few, uh, a few uh, supposedly comedy films, but. Uh, Frank Capra, with this that happened one night, which we, they bored Gable, they bored Claudette. Uh, this put Columbia on the map out of Property Row. So you can see that the, the, uh, the reason for the luncheon, but it was, it, it was a great occasion. You know, and it, and the many, many people there, Dave Chasen gave it. And, uh, John Houston and Reuben Mamoulian and uh, uh, Rob Bellamy and Peter Falk and uh, quite a quite, quite a and it, it's wonderful sort of their their uh, reaction and the things they said about Capra. Uh, but those those pictures I well, they first did uh, you can't take it with you was on one loan out, and uh, Capra just, uh, he had it, he had it, uh, it, it was all his own, it, it, it's different, no, nobody's, nobody's able to, to sort of create the thing that he, uh, that he did, I don't, I don't think so. And what was it? Was it the was it the writing? Was it the the way he worked with actors? Was it the editing? What was what was special about? It? I think it was that Capra himself has has certain values that he learned learned as a kid that he was born with. I don't know, but he that he had certain values. He had family and community and love of country and. Uh, uh, love of God, and uh, all, all, he, he's he's able to he's able to put those values up on the screen, which is a remarkable remarkable thing when you think about it. How was he uh, like to work with as an actor? I mean, did he give you a lot of input? Did he run a really dictatorial set? No. No, he's very quiet and very, uh, he's, he does all those things that I said, those values that he has, but one of the main things he has that, uh, that is really quite rare, he does it with humor. And I remember the uh, It's Wonderful Life, the first picture I did after I got out of the war, it was just uh, no script, 
No, nothing. So, somebody had written him a letter, and in the letter, he for some reason said just a phrase, no man is poor if he has friends. And then there's another phrase, nobody's born to be a failure. And with those two things, Capra, Capra took the two. I'll never forget. I hadn't, uh, I wasn't under contract at Metro Golden Mary anymore. My contract ran, ran out during the war. And Fonda and I were just uh, sort of sitting and wondering how things were going to come out and flying kites and building building model airplanes and then but Capper called me up and he said I I've got an idea for a uh, picture why don't you come over and let me let me tell him, well I couldn't I couldn't get over fast enough and he said now this is just a, this fellow's in a small town and uh, he's going to kill himself and there's an angel named Clarence, and he hadn't had his wings yet, and he comes down, and you're going to jump off the bridge, but but uh, Clarence comes down, and he jumps in the water, but Clarence can't swim, so you say, he said, this doesn't sound very good, does it? I said, Frank, Frank, I, if, if, you want, if you want somebody to play, a fellow that's going to kill himself, and uh, uh, the Clarence is an angel that hasn't won his wings yet. I'm your man. Please, please. Which I think is the wisest decision I ever made. But that, I, I've heard that that's your favorite movie, It's a Wonderful yeah. Life. Why? Well, I just think for those reasons that it wasn't from a play, it wasn't from an actual happening, and it wasn't from a, a book. It was, it, it was from, the, from those two thoughts. That's it. That's... that's uh, that, that's the way it. He, of course, he he gave the gave the two thoughts to Hackett and Goodrich, and in six weeks they had they had the script. Uh, but they, they, here here again, the values that he was able to put up there on the on the screen, it, you know, you, genius isn't a word that should be battled around or everything. But I think. He approaches it. He was also, though, wasn't he? I mean, a wonderful filmmaker. I mean, it's not just a lot of people have good ideas, but I mean, he he realized them so beautifully, and the way he, he cut and edited. I mean, he was he was a terrific movie maker. One of one of the finest, one of the finest. But I think getting getting these values that he has, getting them up there on the screen, so that visually. Visually, uh, the audience yeah, it gets to the audience. Did, did he direct a lot? Did he kind of leave you alone? How was how was he in that sense? Is a director to an actor? He didn't. Uh, he didn't direct a lot. He didn't. Uh, don't, he he made sure that you sort of understood the scene. He was. Uh, he he was. Uh, but he was. He he, he was. Every once in a while, he'd come up and say, "Now, Jim, this is all right, but uh, I, it, it, it's not funny enough." No, I, I, I hadn't thought about that the scene should have any funny stuff in it. I don't, but the minute he s suggested it, I said, well, "Yeah, you know, I knew I knew what he meant," and this this. I think I, I think makes him in a sort of a class by himself that he was using those values that I said and putting them up there with humor. This is a this is a uh, and he he has his uh, when he says cut in the camera. If he doesn't like it, he'll come up and tell you so, and not not uh, just in. Just in general terms, no, he'll tell you why he doesn't like it. I never forget, and Mr. Smith, they, uh, I don't know how many weeks I talked on the filibuster, but I, it was, uh, 
it was getting sort of near the end, and I was I was supposed to, you know, I'd been talking so long that I, I uh, supposed to lose my voice. And Frank came up to me at the end of the day one time, and he said, "Jim, you uh, you sound uh, like what you're doing. You're you're talking like this. I I." Uh, you, you're, you're not convincing me that you have a sore throat. And, and uh, I, th I thought on the way home, I said, gee, that's, I, I, I know, I, I'm just doing that. I, I, what? And I didn't, and I, I, got a little, I got a little desperate about the thing, and I stopped, I stopped at a doctor I knew. This wouldn't go with the method uh, acting at all. I stopped to a doctor I knew, and I, I said, C could you give me a sore throat? He said, you know, I've, I've heard you Hollywood people are a bunch of crazy nuts, but you take the cake. You mean, it's taken me 15 years to learn, and by practice, and learn, to learn how to cure sore throats, and to keep people from having them. And you come here, in here and ask me if I'll give you a sore throat. He said, I'll give you the sorest throat you ever had in your life. So he took a tube, bichloride of mercury. And not, not near my vocal cord or anything, but put it on. And he said, now, well, of course. I, I, and, I, <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's fine. Well, he was so... He was so amazed and, and fascinated with this uh, that I'd come in, and uh, I don't know what had happened to his practice the next day, but when I got to the studio, he was there in my dressing room. He said, I, this wears off, and uh, I thought I'd better uh, come down. And, and, uh, and during the day, every once in a while, I'd come in and I'd say, Doc, it's getting better. <laughs> And he'd say, okay, bring them out. And I, I said, no, that's fine. That's great. But I, as I say, the, the actor's studio would, wouldn't approve of that and everything, but I, uh, uh, I, I, I knew what Frank meant, and Frank never, never mentioned it. I, I didn't tell him. You didn't tell him how you'd, you'd no, go to the no, doctor? He thought, no. my God, he's really gotten the, the no, point. And he's, no, but Frank, Frank he, he, didn't, he didn't say anything. Uh, and I, I just, I just decided not to tell him. <laughs> uh, you once said that that actors create tiny pieces of time that 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 people never forget. And and going back to It's a Wonderful Life, one of them that you talk about. And in fact, I think you you've said that it's one of your favorite scenes ever. Is the one in the bar after you've uh, you, some you've yelled at somebody and they hit you and you start looking up and. Praying to God, right? Yeah. Yeah. That that uh, I've noticed it. I've noticed it over the years with the fans, with people. You, you they can happen any place. Up, up and, uh, and somebody will come up to me and say, oh, "I've I've seen a lot of your pictures, and I they uh, some of them are pretty good, but the one, one I." One I like the best. You you were in this room, and uh, this, this guy you just had an argument with him, and everything. I, I, you couldn't remember the picture. He couldn't remember who it was, was in it. Couldn't remember uh, the the story or anything. He said he said something to you, and uh, you resented it, and you turned on him. And I that, that look you gave him, I thought that now that that. Uh, I knew exactly the picture, I knew exactly the guy, I knew exactly when I shot it, and I knew that that, I knew, knew that was a moment that, that worked. So that, that, that's, that, that's, I think Peter Bogdanovich and I were talking about it, and I, I, I said about the little piece of time, uh, I think it's true. I think it's true in the, in the theater, too. It can it, it it can be all sorts of things. It can be 
a statement, a movement. It can be a look. It, 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 uh, a little more effective in the movie because you can get up, get up close for the reaction. Are there certain tiny pieces of time in your in your movies that you remember? You remember that you think that was that was good. Well, that uh, that uh, that one and it's wonderful life. That that that, uh, that was one I I remember. Uh, Describe that just briefly, if you will. I mean, what what the what the scene is. And well, that uh, you were right. I was in that bar, this bar, and I had called this guy's wife up and and uh, raised Cain with her about something and everything. And he, his wife, had evidently told him about it. Uh, and I was there, and so. Somebody called me George Bailey, and, and he turned and he said, oh, you're George Bailey, you called my wife, and so and so. And so he let me have it, and, then, and um, that was when I got up and just was about ready to uh, do it and just look up and, uh, a few words of prayer. Any other scenes that you remember like that, special moments that are your favorites? Well, that's... Several times in westerns, western. I remember one day I was in real trouble. I ran into a bunch of guys. We were doing it up in Wyoming, someplace, and they were, we were, we were trying to figure out how how to get me down because there were quite a few of them. And uh, they didn't want to kill me, but they did. They, 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 they uh, well, I forget exactly what it was. But I think that there was a fireplace with them, and the fire almost out. And on. I said, "Why doesn't somebody lasso me and uh, pull me off my, off my horse and then pull pull me through the fire?" So that's all right. So. It, we worked it all right and got it, uh, got the got the pieces of wood out of the fire and, and everything, and uh, pulled me off the horse and I, and the camera was behind the uh, behind the, well just to one side was the guy that was pulling that had lassoed me and was pulling me off, but then as I went through the fire, the camera came back and I mean we're just looking up which was very effective. Sounds it. Yeah. Sounds it. Frank Capra once said, and it's an interesting quote, he said that Jimmy Stewart's gift was, quote, the ability to act what he sang as though he just thought of it. It looked as if there was no acting at all. Yeah, that's the thing I've always felt. Uh, and it's uh, sometimes confused with the, the idea of just playing yourself or uh, your you're natural or something. You, you, you get that every once in a while. Well, making a movie is the most unnatural thing that could be, you know. You, you, you're up here doing it with the cameras, with the lights and everything. I've always felt that if you can do it and not have the acting show, that's the thing Fonda and I always, always felt. If you can do the scene and not have the acting show, then believability starts sneaking in. And if you've got people believing what you're, what you're doing up there and the, the, what, what, what's happened up there, well, you, you know, you're, you're in very good shape. But, but you know, as, you know so they say that the, the hard thing in, in acting is honesty. Once you've learned to fake that, you've, you've got everything. Uh, I mean, that's the hardest thing in the world, as you say. How do you... How do you Make it seem natural. How do you make it seem as if this I'm is, not reading a script? I'm just I'm I'm talking. This is the this is learning the craft. Really, I have no other no other explanation of it. It's learning the craft and 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 sort of developing a a judgment about as you study the script. That you 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 you. you are able to, by experience and by sort of your your time of learning, you're you're able to pick this little 
thing, maybe it's a line, maybe it's a reaction or anything, you're able to do that and, and uh, you, ne you never go and say, would it be all right for me to do this? And you you, pull, it on the, you pull it on the director and see if he likes it. You don't talk about it before. No, you? no, that, I think that's, that, that's a part of the job of the actor. Hitchcock always said that. But somebody said, you, you know, Hitchcock, the thing about actors are cattle, <clears throat> that everybody. And Hitch, he, he never said, he said, I, I, I don't believe that. I, I, actors are, aren't cattle. A actors should be treated as, as, as cattle. Well, I, I, I think what he means is that uh, he, he does the setup, he writes the script, he's got the whole story in mind, everything, and as soon as the set's lit and everything, he says, all right, come on, get in and do this is what you're being paid for, go on and, and do it. And, uh, you know, like a cowboy herding a bunch of, bunch of cattle in the, into a corral. And that's all right, I believe that. Uh, the, uh, the Hitchcock, uh, that's the way he works. He'd come up to me every once in a while and say, Jim, the scene's tired. And I knew exactly what, I, what, it, what it meant. No pace, no pace, and, and, and uh, drawn out too much. But this, this isn't a long discussion about uh, what, what motivates you to stretch things out. I don't know, he said, the scene's tired. And invent all sorts of things. I remember at the end of Rear Window, I had the broken leg and all the things. Then it was called at the end of the picture. And the guy, Raymond Burr, comes over and I, and throws me out. He, Hitch came up and said, Jim, what would you think of breaking the other leg when he throws you out the window? It's fine. So it took time, so I ended up to the... But this is it, it, just uh, imp improvisation and it just, it, it just, it wasn't in the script, it, it just came to his mind. Over the years, uh, you co-starred with all the special women. And, and let me ask you, just to give me thumbnail sketches, if you will, <laughs> about a, f a few of them. Uh, Marlena Dietrich. Yeah, amazing. Amazing, and I, and I she knew more, about, technically, she knew more about pictures than almost anybody I've ever seen. She taught me, and to think like we're doing now, uh, over shoulder, uh, or, or, or maybe uh, much closer than this, just a close over shoulder, uh, to always keep your eyes on one eye, on the down stage eye toward the camera, because you can't look, you, 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 they say, you look, look a person in the eye. You can't do that. You've got to shift, your, you, 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 your two eyes can't look at the two eyes separately. You've got to go, and, and by doing that, you, you, you shift, and you go yes, from sir. one to the other, and it's very distracting. I never knew it until I, I, she, she showed me in one of the, uh, the uh, rushes, the man, but she, she, she noticed that they just keep your eye on the down, on the downstage uh, eye of the p person you're playing to. She knew lighting, like I've never seen, so that should be a little over here, that should be. She was a great, great girl. And do anything, right? like the fight we had, the Industry. fight she had with Una Merkel and Destry rides again. She never never asked for any double or anything. She did the whole thing herself. How about Jean Arthur? Jean Arthur was just humor. This is this is it's so humor without being a comedian, you know. Or it it it's just I I, I suppose a lot of it is it's born in you because I don't uh, to develop humor, real humor. I, I would think it would be very difficult unless you basically you sort of had 
that humor. I don't know, it's humor in your outlook on life, humor about every, every things that happen every day. But Jean had that. She, she, she knew where the humor should fit. How about Carol Lombard? Same thing, the humor. Human, a beautiful girl, beautiful, wonderful. Uh, but and I, I did a thing with quite a quite a serious, uh, uh, quite a serious picture. But there was, she kept it from getting dire and getting, uh, getting down, with with that wonderful humor. How about Catherine Hepburn? She had probably, or has, just uh, all, all the qualities, all the qualities, the humor, the glamour. There, again, I don't, I don't know what that is, but she had uh, glamour, glamour, and very, uh, very positive in her thinking, very positive, and uh, if she thought a scene went well, she'd say so. If she didn't, she didn't. And, uh, difficult or not? Not difficult, no. Not difficult, but just uh, just <coughs> letting people know that what this is what she thinks, and, and uh, let's do something about it. She'd know, Carrie had made a couple of pictures with her before, and I, but this was my first. Philadelphia story. Yeah. And I, I remember, remember one Friday. This was when we were five days a week. But one fr one Friday, she said at the end of the working day, she said, "I'd like to go flying with you. I'll be out at Cloverfield at eight thirty tomorrow morning." And I said, "All right." Well, I'd, I'd been flying. So I learned to fly in nineteen thirty-five, and I, I didn't have an airplane, but I, I. Uh, had my uh, had my private pilot's license, so I bore. A, I was f flying in an open cockpit fleet uh, airplane, which I didn't think would. So I I borrowed a Fairchild from the guy in the hangar next next door, which I'd flown before. And she was there right on the dot and everything. And I had the airplane all warmed up, and I got her in beside me. And she started from the minute I started taxiing. She said, "Not you're you're uh, you're taxiing too fast." Goes, uh, she said, and knocked knocked on one of the oil temperatures. She said, "The the, the oil temperature is low." I said, "No, that's 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 it's always been there. If it's had, it hasn't known." She said, "There's something wrong." With it. Tapped. She said, uh, "Now watch the watch the turn as will you." If you as you turn down the taxi strip here, just go go, go a little slower. And uh, I did. And then when I was warming up the engine for takeoff, she said, and knocked on the tachometer. She said, "That's uh, what's what's that needle wavering?" And I, and I said, "They, they uh, it's been wavering like that, Kate, for a long time, and it doesn't mean it. Please, it's done." She said, uh, "All right, all right, let's let's." Uh, Let's go. So I went out and took off, and the clover fields right near the ocean, the, the beach, and uh, I wanted to stay in the traffic pattern and then go off uh, up into Saugus and around the hill. But I started to turn after we maybe 500 feet, and she said, "Don't turn." <laughs> I said, okay, and I said, then. A minute or so later, I turned. She said, "Keep straight." I said, "Kate, you know what, what's out there? If we keep straight, then there's China out there. Do you want?" <laughs> and uh, she finally let me turn. And I said, "Would you like to go over uh, to Saugus and uh, to sort of go, go through the hills?" She said, "No, I want to land." So I got back in the traffic pattern. And. Uh, as I turned on on base leg, she said, "Your flaps aren't down," and they weren't. So I put the flaps <laughs> down. 
Then, as we got on final approach, it was the, the speed. She, she objected to all speeds, and I changed wavered around 100 miles an hour, 70, 80, 110, away around, she said, up a little more, more flaps, more, and the landing wasn't a landing. The, the landing was a controlled crash. <laughs> and she <laughs> went like that, and I, and I taxied in, and uh, Taxi her open, cut the engine, let, let her out the gun. She went to her car, bomb, bomb. Never mentioned it again, ever. That was Kate Hepburn, huh? That, that's Kate Hepburn. How about Grace Kelly? Grace Kelly, bless her heart. She's. I couldn't believe. <clears throat> couldn't believe when I did that picture with rear window. This was her fifth picture. It was my fortieth or something like that. But the idea that. This girl can come out, and in five pictures, they come just a, a, right up there with the top ones. Amazing, wonderful, warm, beautiful quality to her. How about Kim Novak? Everybody sort of, uh, for a while, when she was just starting, everybody said, well, you know, she's a beautiful girl and everything, but the acting is little. Hitch, Hitchcock had, was going to use Vera Miles, who he had signed. In Vertigo. In Vertigo. And uh, Vera was going to have a baby, so, and uh, she, she thought she would go, but it was too far along, so she couldn't. So uh, Hitch, Hitch uh, tested Kim, and I liked her. We'd been working on the picture about three days, and Kim came over to Hitch, was sitting down in the director chair. And Hitch, uh, Kim said, uh, Mr. Hitchcock, on this scene I'm doing with Jim Stewart, I, I don't think, uh, I, the motivation that I have and what uh, I'm, I'm thinking about as I approach <coughs> him, knowing what I do, do about myself and knowing what I do, do about Jim. I don't, the motivation isn't quite, and, and Hitchcock said, Kim, it's only a movie. <laughs> and that, uh, that did it with Kim, and Kim never, never mentioned it again, never, never mentioned motivation again, and, and was awful good in the picture, excellent in the picture. And excellent in, in lots of pictures after that, I and mean, she was very good. Let me back up from, from Kim Novak in the, in the 50s and go back to World War II. Uh, the war started and you were about the first big Hollywood star to enlist. How come? How come? It's very simple. I was drafted. It's a good reason. It's, it's the, uh, I, I, I say it's the, first, the only lottery I've ever won. <laughs> I think, you know, there are millions and millions of drafts going on. My number was 326 out of that million. So uh, I was drafted. I was underweight. And saying, I just went to the guy and said, uh, just don't, don't put down the, the weight. I mean, that's not important. I'm, I'm not, nothing wrong with me physically. I mean, let's, let's get this clear, because the fact was you were so underweight that you might have been kept out of the, the military because of that, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, the military has a, a certain for height. They have certain weights. Certain, yeah. and that, that's uh, and you were well, off I, the scale. You were minimum. I, I was uh, I was off the scale, and everybody made a fuss about it and everything. But I just finally went to the went to the guy at the draft office and I said, "Please just uh, just to put it put it up what it's supposed to be," and and that's the last time I ever went on the scales in the army. But I I it was about. Nine months before Pearl Harbor, I served as an enlisted man. And because of my flying, I had about 400 hours and a commercial license. I, uh, when we got in the war after Pearl Harbor, they, uh, they gave me a commission. I, the, the thing, they have a thing in the Army that, which they've had for a long time, extension courses that I was able to take while I, I was an enlisted man, so I got my commission that way, and uh, 
they put me right, and I, I was at a Moffett Field in California, which was a basic training base. But they sent me up to Mather Field, which was right near Sacramento, and I instructed. I instructed there for several months. Then they sent me to four engine school, and then uh, flew bombardiers on the, the, the Norden bomb site was just being developed. And I helped the flu bombardiers in uh, getting uh, getting used to using the site, and then finally went to Sioux City, Iowa, and was uh, was given a bomber squadron. And and flew how many missions over Germany? Twenty. With your heart in your mouth each time, or or no? It, it, it just just the same thing as I said, uh, stage fright. I, I, it's terrible before you get on stage. I think it was the same. It uh, it wasn't any good at all the night before the mission. But the minute I got in the airplane and got uh, everything and got briefed and everything, I, I, I and I did a lot of praying. I, I but I I was I was worried more about making a mistake than for my life, for then, really. Because in the kind of operation that we did over there, that m making a mistake, you could, you could wipe out uh, a lot of lives. You had a, a very, very distinguished war record, and it's been suggested uh, that your, your war experience may account for, for more complex roles and, and performances after the war, that, that uh, thereafter we saw more the, the dark side or the frailty of, of Jimmy Stewart in, in movies. Do, do you believe it was, it, not that that's why you did it, but that it turned out in some sense to be a, a turning point for you? Well, I suppose. I suppose uh, I, 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 uh, I certainly didn't uh, feel it at the time. Uh, but I think a, a, a lot had to do with a, uh, with maturity. I I'd matured, uh, you know. I was I was 31 or something, 32 when I went in, and four years later, I, there, there's there's maturity there, and it uh, it could could very well have, uh, have had something to do about the type of type of picture. One of the things that you did when you came back, and this was a few years later in 1950, is you went back to Broadway for the first time in 15 years mm -hmm. and did Harvey with that invisible rabbit. How come? I was back and I, Frank Fay had been playing, I think, four years or something like that. But I came back and saw the picture and I saw the play and the producer, Brock Pemberton, in between the, the acts, came down and said, how do you like it? I said, it's the most wonderful thing I've ever seen in my life. He said, well, why don't you play it? I said, any time, I, I, I'd love more. I, I, thought, I thought he was kidding. Two weeks later, he called me and said, Frank Fay hasn't had a vacation. And uh, come back here and, and, uh, and do the play for four weeks so he can take a vacation. I was right back. and I went, I, I rehearsed with Pemberton. I never got to rehearse with the whole cast until two days before it went on. The play opened and everything. I got absolutely murderous, awful reviews. They weren't, weren't only terrible because of my, my uh, acting, but they say, how dare he, how dare he fill in for this Frank Fay who is, who, who, the, is Elwood P. Dowd, yeah. but the uh, the audience was fine, and the audience and I sort of got into it a little better and everything. And uh, I said, "All right." So, well, the next the next summer, Brock called me and said that Frank had got into a sort of a bad habit uh, with that vacation. He wants to take another one <laughs> when you come back and. Uh, uh, and I said, sure, sure. So I went back and he invited the critics back. 
same reviews, terrible, terrible. But it didn't discourage me because I, and it, and it gave me sort of an inside track on the movie when they sold the movie. I never, never thought the real idea of Harvey and the uh, and Elwood was as good in the movie as it is on the stage because you, it's something you you really have to create. And uh, it, it, in in movies, the idea of the supernatural, the idea of the invisible thing, it's it's done so much, and it, people realize that it can be done in the, all sorts of ways in the movies. But in the play, it, it's, it's a real challenge. And I fell in love with the play. And I was going to ask you that, because, I mean, you did the movie, and then you came back in the 70s and did revivals. What's so special about that, that play to you? I just, it just absolutely, how can I describe it? The idea, the idea that you, you're, you're faced with this, you're, you're faced with this challenge, and that is to make, the audience feel that you have this this uh, rabbit beside you, and that he's there. And I could I could tell when I I could tell when it was working. And it's one of the biggest thrills I've ever had in, in uh, acting, I, because I could tell the audience was with me, and they they saw it. Saturday afternoon matinees were no good. This is this is tough. This is when the mother says what, to the son, like this, come again, and the son, what's it going to be about? And they said, well, this man, this man uh, has this friend, and he's a big white rabbit. Oh, and the kid said, fine. I knew it was coming every son, and uh, I, I, because I could see kids getting restless and uh, kids whispering, and every once in a while, the voice would come out from a nine, eight, seven-year-old, where's the rabbit? <laughs> so I was dead for the rest of the performance. <laughs> that, that would, that would that, shoot, that, shoot it that, all, huh? That wiped it out. One other thing you did about that same time in, in 1950, I think it was, uh, is that you broke some new ground. You, you started, instead of taking a straight salary in movies, taking a percentage of the gross. Mm. Uh, and you were, I, th I think, about the first first actor to do that. Uh, no, it, it, it had been done before. I not often. How did that come about? My agent, the agent who was Lou Wasserman, who is now the MCA Corporation, who is now head of Universal, he worked, he worked the thing out. And I mean, what would you think of that? that I, mean, I suppose in some sense it's taking a, a risk rather than that straight salary. Well, he convinced me that it, uh, it, it, it was worth the uh, it, it was worth the chance, it, it, and it, it proved proved more or less successful. Starting in '49, you made over the course of the next ten years, I guess, four movies with Hitchcock. What was he like to work with? Well, he had his own, as I say, about the uh, actors or cattle. He had a, he. I never saw saw him look through a camera. I'd look through the finder in the camera. He would just do this, and his Bob Burks, his cameraman, would stand behind him. Hitchcock would say, I want that. And this included the scene. And then go and sit in his chair and wait until Burks uh, had the scene lit and everything. And then he would say, all right, the actors go on, on, move around there and see how it feels. And this happened everything. Hitchcock always wore, wore a blue suit and a tie. He, he knew the play, he knew the, the script so well that he was a terrible problem for the script girl because he, Hitchcock, like, uh, like John Ford, didn't have too much respect for the spoken word, which I think uh, is sort of an advantage in both of them because uh, Ford said this, that if you, if you can't get a scene up there on the screen without using the spoken word, if you, if you can't get it and tell the story visually, 
without relying on the spoken word, you're not using the medium correctly. And I think, uh, and the, the Hitch, Hitch felt the same way, because it is a visual thing, and it should, it should, uh, it, 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 it should tell you tell you the story visually. What what did did he give you much input or much freedom? You tell the story about Kim Novak, but I mean, what did he see your role as pretty much say what's written, or was he willing to listen to? to suggestions, and did he appreciate emoting on yeah. that? No, no, we were per per perfectly <laughs> open to, uh, to suggestions, and, and, but he, he, sort of liked, he sort of liked you to go in and do it the way you had sort of worked out uh, the way you are going to do it. If he didn't like it, he'd tell you so. If he, if, he, uh, if he thought it was all right, he wouldn't say anything, but he'd say, all right, let's, let's Let's roll the camera. Your roles in, in those movies, and I guess especially in Rear Window and Vertigo, are among your most complex and your most vulnerable. What do you think of those roles? It was a challenge, and I, uh, I think Hitch, uh, I, I, I give the credit to Hitchcock. I mean, it just by, he, he he would spend months and months and months on the on the script, so it was, and and knew it, but knew every every line of it, and it, it knowing that, knowing that, he knew what he wanted to see on the on the screen. It was a challenge to try to try and give him what he wanted, uh, and 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 give it to him quick. He, he almost cut the picture in the camera, and never many takes, and there never, uh, never two cameras, and never, and and, uh, and the, uh, the film at the rushes. They didn't last very long because he 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 just cut the, and never the long shot, then over shoulder shot, then close up. No, no. He knew what he wanted. If it, if, if it was necessary, as far as Hitchcock was concerned, he'd do it. But the, the spoken word, either the story, I remember with doing Man Who Knew Too Much with Doris Day, and we were in the Albert Hall in London, and the London Symphony was playing, and there's going to be an assassination, and the signal is the, the symbols. And all that time, I'm I'm going up the steps to the balcony uh, with Doris, and I have this long speech, which sort of, sort of clears up a lot of the uh, mystery about the kidnapping of our child and the, uh, everything. And this long, and after I'd done it a couple of times in rehearsal, Hitch came to me and he said, "You're talking so much that I'm unable to enjoy the London Symphony." So just cut, cut. Cut all the cut all the talk out, and, and I said, Hitch, isn't it, isn't it important here? I'm I'm uh, I'm sort of winding up the the idea and leading up to the assassination. He said, just uh, just chase Doris up the stairs, don't say anything. And of course he was right. He was completely right. You know, the the symphony was building and building. If if he if I had been talking or anything, he would have to cut down the volume of the the, the music to hear me. When this this way, the the symphony was up uh, up uh, at the right level, and I was chasing Doris up the stairs. And much better. Were those, and I think particularly a Vertigo, where you're you know you're playing this detective who's lost his nerve and has this this mental problem of vertigo uh, and, and, and the whole strange feeling for Kim Novak. Is that a, was that a much harder part to play than Jefferson Smith and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? No, I don't think so. I guess what I'm asking is, are tortured people harder to play than maybe what, what seems on the screen as simpler people? I, 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 I never thought of it that way, but I... I, uh, I, I I don't know. Looking back over the things I've done and so on, I, I've sort of come up with the thing that that I I sort of tend to hit, 
hitch on to the to the parts, the roles, where vulnerability is a big factor. And this goes for you, you know westerns and all all sorts of ones. So that you 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 sort of read in and play into your to your role vulnerability. You know you're you're not so the audience is is with you, but they're not sure you're going to make it. They're not, you know. Uh, but I think that there again, there again, work, learning, practice. Do you have a favorite Hitchcock movie? I probably Rear Window. I would think. You, 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 during the fifties and sixties, you made a lot of westerns, and you said. Let me get the let me get the quote right. That a western is the most honest thing that can go on film. What do you mean by that? I don't remember ever saying that, but it's I suppose true. I I think it's it's the best example that we have of telling the story visually. Because in a western, nobody says anything, and it's done visually, so that it's. Uh, this, along with the idea that it, uh, the, the Western, can be worldwide because you you don't you don't need uh, the spoken word, so you, so you don't have an, have the language problem. And the Western is a sort of most of the Westerns are a story of the settlement of our country and what what happened. Which I think is, uh, this is interesting to people all, all over the world. You know, you talk about, about the visual. Can you get as much satisfaction as an actor in a good reaction shot, a piece of physical business as you can in a long speech? I mean, is that as challenging and mean as much to you? I think it's, a, it's just as challenging. It's just as challenging and uh, your it's not, a, not the idea of taking a chance, but your your uh, the 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 speech, the long speech. This this you you sort of work this out, but taking a chance on on a, a little different look and a little different thing. This this is uh, I think more challenging than the long speeches. And so on. you did work on westerns with with John Ford. What was he like? Well, he was very, very special. He uh, he didn't follow the rules of movie making. He just made his own. He, uh, as I say, he he hated the spoken word. He uh, usually you you talk about, and there's so many of them. You talk about how is it on the set. It, Set the complete tranquility on the set, and everything moves. Ford, uh, Ford didn't agree with that at, at all. Ford wanted tension on the set. This is this is why he got got a, a certain feeling that is Ford and nobody else's. He wanted tension. Well, and he he got it in all sorts of ways. He'd get on poor Duke Wayne on it and just just get him so embarrassed and so terrible that he, uh, Duke would, uh, and they loved each other, uh, they were devoted to each other, but he, he would, uh, he would just come out and everybody would say, gosh, I, I wonder uh, when's it going to happen to me and everything. And that this, this is the way he worked. This is the way, the tension not only in the, not only with the actors, but with the, all the crew members and everything. And, and what, to what end? I mean, well, how did he think that would help? I don't know. Everybody was sort of like this, and and he made he he used this to his advantage in getting it on film. Well, in Liberty Valance, it sure seemed to work, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This uh, and the he was on Duke the whole time. Duke would come up to me and say. Why the hell did we? Why, why does it always have to be on me? Why didn't it get get on you? Sometimes. 
I, I said, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, we got near the end of the picture, and Duke was still, he was still on Duke. And for the fellow by the name of Woody Strode, black actor, a wonderful guy, and an excellent actor. And on the last scene of the picture, Woody comes out and, oh, and overhauls. Uh, and Ford, for some reason, called me over and he said, what, what do you think of that, uh, the costume on Woody? Now, why I said this, I don't know. I said, it looks a little Uncle Remus-y, doesn't it? He said, I see, it does. And he motioned the, the assistant director to blow the whistle. And he got everybody around, the crew, everybody and around. He said, I just wanted to make a, a statement that probably you haven't noticed. We have a racist in our company. I didn't uh, know it until just a few minutes ago. Uh, each one of you can treat him the way you feel like it, uh, but I just wanted you to, uh, to know that. Now we'll get back to work. And Duke came up to me and said, ah, he finally got you. <laughs> yeah. You have been a star now for 50 years. How do you account for your longevity at the top of the business? Number one, a sort of a love and devotion to what I'm doing. Uh, I also feel that a, a, an actor never stops learning. In other words, some, some people say that, uh, some people say that, uh, or ask the question, when did you know that you had reached the top? I, I, that, uh, I, I, I never thought of it in those terms. I think that uh, I, you don't reach the top. You, uh, uh, an actor is, an actor never finished learning his craft. But why you? I mean, uh, you're obviously a very, very good actor, craftsman, as you say, and you obviously have uncommon energy and persistence over a long period of time. But why do you think it is that, that of all the actors, that you were one of those very few that people wanted to go see over and over again? Do you, I mean, do you, I, I'm asking you not to brag, I'm really asking you to analyze. No, I just, uh, as I said before, I just think of it, I, I, I have a, a certain devotion to the business of acting. And do you think that to the audience that comes through? I think uh, because I have tremendous respect for the audience and uh, I, I, I believe that uh, just like I said when, uh, when I knew that <clears throat> it was getting to the audience but that I had Harvey next to me I, I, uh, I can tell by, by fan letters I try and read all my fan mail answer it all but I can tell from that that it's, it's, I'm coming through every once in a while. I think it was, I think it was Spencer Tracy who once said that the key thing for an actor is to get uh, people, the audience, to like you, to, to root for you, to feel that they're on the same team with you in some sense. And do you think that was part of your appeal? I think probably. I think that, uh, but they, I, th I think just getting back to the idea of complete devotion to what you're doing and trying your best. You also have a, have a strong sense of what movies and what Jimmy Stewart uh, should be all about. At the, at the last Reagan inaugural gala, you got up and, and talked about the old Hollywood quote where patriotism and family were exalted. I mean, that's what you think movies, and especially movies you're in, should be about, isn't it? I think one of the, one of the troubles with movies today is there isn't enough variety. I mean, there's too much about one thing. There's too much. You, 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 uh, the, 
it's one thing about the, the motion picture that I think that will keep it around forever is that it's capable of a tremendous variety of stories, of ideas, of, of happenings. I, I don't think this exists today. And it did in the, in the studio days. The, the heads of the studio the, 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 insisted on variety. And that, that this was a part of they were taking chances, perhaps, but they, they, they insisted on going out and, and, uh, and doing a variety of things. But you also, and this gets, I suppose, back to our discussion earlier about Frank Capra, have a, have a strong sense that, that good, strong family values, family, honor, country yeah. Yeah, should go, be in movies, yes? I, I go along with Frank on all those things, yeah. I think they're important, and then they, uh, they're important, and they're, they're worthwhile, and worthwhile presenting if, if you, if you uh, learn in learning your craft, if you can learn to get those values up on the screen, I think, I, I think that's, that's important. We lost a son, our oldest boy, in Vietnam. And I've been asked about that several times, but I, I, my wife Gloria and I agree on one thing, that it, it isn't a tragedy. When you look at it, here's a, here's a young man, not a good student, but he was dis determined to graduate from college because we wanted him to. And he did graduate from college. And he didn't want to go on the draft. This was when the, the draft was started. He wanted to enlist and he wanted to be a Marine. And he went through boot camp and he went through the whole thing and was commissioned as a Marine. And he was a good Marine. And on the field of battle, he conducted himself in a gallant manner. And I don't think that's tragedy. Loss, I think of them every day. A terrible loss, but it's not a tragedy. You know, Luella Parsons, I guess it was about 30 years ago, said that Jimmy Stewart is the most nearly normal of all the Hollywood stars. And I think what she meant is that while you seem to have enjoyed what you call the glamour and the extraordinary life you've had, that you, did, you didn't get carried away by it, did you? No, I guess not. I guess not. I, I'm Hank Fonda would, would uh, I think, say, say the same thing. Not, uh, not just... Uh, but it was it was something that made your learning and made the hard work that you're going through exciting. And uh, I, I think this uh, this is a, a great asset that the glamour, whatever the glamour means, the glamour was there. And for me, I know it was a great asset to me in in my work and in my life in Hollywood. But you must have known many people who did get carried away, whether it was on drugs or, or alcohol, or just their temperament that they, that, you know, because they were in so in demand and could command such enormous money and power and, and you know, whatever they wanted they'd get, that they, mm -hmm. that they lived that way, yes? I think it had a lot to do with the way I was brought up, with my mother and father and my sisters. I, I, uh, here you get back to sort of values, sort of, as we talked about before. I, uh, that, that, that could be one of the reasons why I sort of took the thing in stride. You know, the Jimmy Stewart style has, uh, is so clear, is so identifiable that you've had dozens of, of impersonators mm -hmm. over the years. What do you think of them? Oh, fine. Rich Little and I are very good friends. Yeah, he's, uh, I forget. I pulled, I pulled, we were at a party someplace, a big uh, charity. 
and he was on first, and he, he uh, then I, I, I was supposed to, I was supposed to uh, say something about the charity or something. But I got up and I imitated Rich Little, Rich, uh, imitating me. Well, you, you, for for all time and the Kennedy Center archives, you have to give us your impression of a of a Jimmy Stewart impression. Can you do that? No, oh, no, sure, sure. I, I, uh, I, I, I just, I just sort of. Uh, Talk the usual, usual, really fine, fine way of doing it, and and, and get on with it, and, and uh, don't make any mistakes, and and, and just uh, just uh, just keep talking. Do you think that sounds like you? Well, it's my, I'm 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 imitating Rich Little. <laughs> but do you think those impersonators sound like you or not? I mean, can you can well, you, you see can, the connection? You, you you can't tell what your voice sounds like. It's uh, you you hear it on the screen and everything, but you can't. It's uh, I don't know, but it's some some physical type thing. You can't can't really can't really judge your uh, the the sound of your voice. Let me ask you about that. When you look at movies of yourself, or do do you look at movies of yourself and do you like watching yourself? But in the last <clears throat> in the last uh, few years, I've uh, liked, and especially the Hitchcock pictures, which I hadn't seen in a long time. They opened the when they re-released re them. Uh, they had me up here in New York, and the uh, sort of a festival, and the uh, rear window was uh, was the first one on the festival, and Gloria and I stayed. I made made an appearance on the stage, and Gloria and I stayed and watched the picture. And I must say, I I, I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the picture. I enjoyed I I, I, I the wonderful Grace Kelly and uh, the young young man uh, with dark hair who seemed to be all right. He seemed to be doing all right. Uh, which was, uh, I suppose it's happened before, but uh, not very many times because I, there's a reason why I, years ago I stopped going to, going to rushes because I found that I was just looking at myself. And, and when you do that, you can be very critical, you know, over critical. And I found that I, I, I'd go out and would be discouraged and of course, I, I I had no idea whether the whether the scene played well, whether it was right, or, so I just stopped. I, I, it uh, it didn't help. But when I saw Rear Window after 20 years, I I, I enjoyed the story. So I did wasn't just at all looking looking at myself. At the time in the, the the 30s and 40s and 50s, when you were making those movies, did you go see them? You say you didn't go see the rushes, but would you go see the movie when it was completed? Yeah, I, I, I always went to the preview. I always went to the sneak. And and could you enjoy the movie, or were you just sitting there looking at yourself the whole time? Well, I've been enjoying more, more uh, whether I was getting the laughs at the right place, I think, which I suppose is just uh, still looking at yourself and everything. But uh, <coughs> it's different when you're in when you're in a house, a movie house full of people, I and mean, you can you can sense the the uh, reaction of the of the people. You are now, <clears throat> and have for several years, been getting all sorts of tributes. Uh, the Kennedy Center Honors. This year, you're going to get an honorary Oscar. Uh, what do those mean to you? A great deal. A great deal. <coughs> I think. I think of them more, uh, I mean, especially the Academy Award. I think of them more as sort of a, a pat on the back by your peers and a sort of a, 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 pat, a pat on the back by your, by your fellow actors, which I think is a very nice thing and a very, very uh, rewarding, rewarding thing. And the Kennedy Center Honors? Same thing. Same thing. It's a. It's a uh, sort of a, a 
pat on the back, given for a sort, of, sort of an overall uh, certain number of years of, of work and uh, effort. And uh, I'm very proud of it, and very, it means a lot to me. This, this may be the toughest question I've asked you all afternoon, but, but when you look at something like the Kennedy Center Honors, and you're there with you know, the real cultural greats of the, of the 20th century, uh, do you feel comfortable being in that company? Do you feel you belong? Well, I, I just feel uh, I just feel honored by being in the company. I, whether I belong there, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I feel honored to be in that company. You are seventy-six. Is is that correct? Yep. How long are you going to keep working? I have no idea. But I, I don't think. I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, the idea of retiring, I don't think uh, actors really, I don't think retire. I think when, uh, I think you, the, the audience will let me know when I should retire. I, I don't think they're ever going to let you know that, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> but I mean, you are perp perfectly prepared to just keep, keep on into your 80s and 90s? I think so. I think so. I love the business. I, I, uh, I think so. I keep looking and reading, reading two or three scripts a month. I, I, I'd like to continue. What would you hope that, that your legacy would be on acting, that, that young actors who look in years ahead uh, towards Jimmy Stewart and the body of work that you've done, what would you hope that they could learn from it? Well, I think that uh, I got this probably with my father. He said one of the most important things in your life is work, hard work. And uh, don't, don't expect too much without making an effort to, to make it happen, whatever you're, whatever you're approaching. Uh, I suppose that I'd well, it's hard, I'm a hard time figuring out how to say it. I, I uh, the work I think and devotion to your to your profession have as you as you grow from experience and work in your profession have it mean something to you more than just a, uh, a, a way of making a living. Have it mean something more to you. Anything in terms of the craft, anything in terms of naturalness, or would it really be basically that, just it's hard work and keep, keep at it? Well, I'd say that have it, have it mean something to you and have it uh, sort of help in increasing your stature, not particularly as, a, uh, as an actor, but uh, just as a person. Which brings me to what I guess may be my last question. As, as Frank Capra might ask, has it been a wonderful life for yes, you? It, yes, it has. I thank God every night for that. Do you feel, when you think of all the actors and, and all the things you've done, and We've just touched on the very surface of it over the course of the, you know, those 50, 60, 70, 76 years. I mean, do you ever think, why me, and feel blessed and lucky? I like, I, I, I have taken my hat off to luck. There's been a lot of that in my life. But the, I, I believe there's been a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Uh, I believe that I've developed a dedication to, to my work that I'm proud of. And you really do sit there and thank God. Thank God. Jimmy Stewart, thank you very much.